welcome to the 2020 Brain and Transcranial Photobiomodulation Virtual Summit. I'm your host, Dr. Joe Dodaro. My guest is uh, Miriam Henke. She's a registered psychologist with a master's degree in health psychology. She has a unique blend of training and qualification and experience and is a leading spokesperson for Mind Body Medicine in Australia, Australia, the creator of the Main Spring Method, as well as holding titles of Senior Clinical Lecturer and Researcher, Research Supervisor at the University of Adelaide. Uh, she runs a successful private practice and as a popular speaker, she has a company that uh, is uh, family owned that specializes in photobiomodulation, phototherapy, red light therapy, medical devices, and mind body medicine products. She's a member of the Australian Association of Psychologists, Inc., and the Australian Integrative Medicine Association. Uh, she's a certified life coach, hypnotherapist, does a lot of that good stuff, and she's also been published in the International Journal of Wellbeing, the Journal for the Advances of Mind Body Medicine. And she was one of the first to be published in an original research as it relates to mindfulness and fibromyalgia. She comes to us from Adelaide, um, Australia. So I'm going to show that now if I can. Hold on. So we can get a picture. Uh -huh. So I'm going to go here. And I go here. And there it is. That's as far out as I can zoom. Yeah, I could go a little bit more so we have an idea. It's a big country. So when we say that you're, you know, we have, we have people coming to us from Sydney and, and Adelaide is quite, how far is it to get to Sydney? It's about a two and a half hour flight or around uh, 2,000 kilometers. Mm. So how does somebody, Marion, thank you for being here. How does somebody as a mind-body specialist and a psychologist, how do, they, how do you lean in to your experience with the transcranial photobiomodulation? How'd you get there? Thanks, Joe. Look, um, my interest in, in red light therapy or, or photobiomodulation started just over two years ago when my partner, who's uh, my, my business partner, my life partner, Michael, he actually organized for us a, a PBM wearable device to try. He'd been interested in PBM for years and he thought, hey, why don't we give this a go? Um, I have uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, an um, underactive uh, autoimmune disease uh, that affects my thyroid and has since the age of 22 and I've been on a long journey to find ways of healing that um, condition. So when, when he said, oh, by the way, there is research around the use of PBM for Hashimoto's, I was, I was in. I was willing to, to give it a go and I started getting benefits. We started using it for a range of other health conditions that we had personally. Michael had been in a car accident um, and he had injuries in his shoulders and uh, the PBM started really healing him as well. So we were convinced from our own personal experience there was something to this and we started looking at how we could potentially make a business around it knowing that others as well would love to get similar results that we had experienced. Is there a lot of people promoting uh, photobiomodulation therapy in Adelaide, in your zone? Not no, really. I would say not. No, it's, it's really quite still an unknown area for most people. Um, we found it very interesting going through the experience of introducing it to our family, our friends, our colleagues. And, you know, as long as we have a, a reasonable way of explaining it, most people are relatively open to the, the concept um, and when people are desperate, and a lot of people have tried like many mainstream, mainstream and um, alternative therapies and still not had relief or, or, or change in a lot of their health conditions, they're willing to try something a little different. And we've been really pleased with a lot of the results that we've been getting from our, our family, friends and, and our customers. Now, are you doing this more in a clinical setting or are you doing this for home use? 
primarily for home use, but we do have a network of clinicians who use them within their clinic settings. And you know, ultimately our devices are, are really easy and safe to use at home. So ultimately we would love to see people have one in every home. It really can uh, start to fill the gaps of where a lot of other products um, and services just aren't able to meet. Well, especially if we're on lockdown. Do you ever think about That's that? Right. People That's with exactly a backache right. or a shoulder ache or a headache or a neck ache, they don't get to go to anywhere anymore. We just have to buy, you know, like we say, put a stick between your teeth. And I think we have a pretty good alternative. Uh, Absolutely. Anything, uh, anything else you want to add before we pop off your slides? Yeah, look, um, as it became something that became more and more in, in our business world, it's, uh, I became more interested in it from a psychology perspective. Um, I don't use photobiomodulation in my private practice as a psychologist, um, but I do have a real interest in seeing where the possibilities may be for that in the future. I think we do need to have more options available for people who have mental health disorders. And this is where I started stepping into the in, looking at photobiomodulation as a treatment for conditions like depression, which is, I guess, what we're talking about today. Wonderful, wonderful. So let's just share your slides. That would be lovely. Um, all right, so I'm... I'm here to talk about um, transcranial photobiomodulation and treatment of depression. And uh, what I have to bring to you today is a little bit about me and what I think um, not only of this as a potential to help a lot of people, millions of people around the world, but also where the field of health psychology could um, operate within that, those efforts. So I've already talked a little bit about with Joe about how I started with uh, photobiomodulation from a personal level as a consumer and how that then led on to my partner Michael and I deciding to set this up as a business and seeking to make efforts to bring uh, photobiomodulation more into the home. And I'd like to talk a little bit about health psychology. A lot of you probably don't even know what health psychology is, so I'll just talk about that briefly. And then I'll start going into the research um, that uh, I've been doing with my uh, research partner, Dr. Donna Roberts, and uh, talk about where this could potentially be in the future as a, an option for people who are suffering from depression, especially treatment-resistant depression. And also just making some comments about where I think we have some opportunities in the future for practitioners of different types um, and modalities, and also what the consumer needs. Uh, so I've already had Joe introduce me, so I won't go into this too much, but I just wanted to say I've had a real long-term interest in complementary and alternative medicines, mostly because of my own health crisis that led me to want to explore what else was out there because mainstream medicine just wasn't offering me enough to give me my quality of life back. And as a professional, um, I'm a health psychologist and I have a private practice based here in the Adelaide Hills. And um, I support people with mood disorders, uh, depression, anxiety, behavior change, uh, helping people improve their lifestyle, the way they care for themselves. And mind-body medicine is of particular interest to me. I, I'm fascinated with how the mind can be used to heal the body and support the body's functions. Um, and uh, chronic uh, illnesses are also a big area as a health psychologist that I support. I have a relationship with the University of Adelaide. I provide ad hoc lectures, um, placements for master's students, and I do research supervision as well, uh, which uh, allows me to keep moving forwards, even as a clinician in the research space as well. Um, I speak and facilitate on a range of topics, mental health, uh, leadership, mind-body medicine, and uh, more and more on this PBM space. Uh, I've created something called the Mainspring Method, which is a mind-body medicine modality that brings together a lot of the research and practices to support how we can facilitate self-healing. Um, and I'm the co-founder and director of Lifespan Dynamics, the company that my partner and I set up. So I talked a little bit about this already, Jo. I, um, I won't revisit it too much, but I just wanted to say that as someone open and interested in other um, modalities that could help my health, this is why uh, PBM came into my life and we tried our own flexible wearable LED belts to help our health conditions. 
So I treated my Hashimoto's and I also had a lot of chronic lower back pain and I'm really pleased to report that through the use of PBM, uh, my Hashimoto's has significantly improved. Um, I'm on about half the medication that I used to be. My functioning is excellent um, and I no longer suffer any lower back pain. And Michael, he treated his shoulders really successfully and also his Achilles, which were causing him problems. And he did that um, in conjunction with physiotherapy very successfully. Um, and it's been great to see that even changes on his uh, x-rays show uh, bone formation, bone growth, where people, doctors said it was impossible. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, so we started using our devices with friends and family, as I said before, and it was really fantastic to see what people got in terms of outcomes. And I've uh, just got a few images from um, family and friends, even our dog. <laughs> um, and our, our four kids, uh, they really just got used to us saying, oh, you've fallen over, you've grazed yourself, you've got a bruise, put a belt on it. You know, you, you know you've got an itch um, from a mosquito bite, put a belt on it and they just accept it and they love it because they're able to get back up and play and be happy again in a short window of time. And we certainly discovered that pets, animals love this stuff too. Uh, this is our dog Banjo, uh, he's an English staffy um, and he's had a couple of tumours and other things that we've used to help um, bring, him, bring him back into a better place in his health. So uh, we really got interested in understanding much more about the science and the evidence of PBM. And uh, when we were setting up our business, we started really getting into reading the literature. Um, Michael's got a background in natural medicine. He had a dietary supplement company for a long time. Um, and he really understands um, medicine and the deeper biomechanical bio um, parts of, of what PBM is, is here to promote and help with. And I did a, a, a big, spreadsheet where I collated all these different conditions that PBM treated and, and made some notes around uh, different protocols and, and evidence around how it could help people for over 100 conditions. And so we, we really loved these, these products that we've got, um, these wearable LED devices, and realized they could help with so many different things and they're just so easy and convenient um, that we decided, you know, we needed to be a part of this movement. We needed to help other people get these amazing benefits that we'd experienced and our family and friends were experiencing. And so we set up our company, which is called Lifespan Dynamics. Um, and we've uh, been going on this adventure, this journey as a startup for the last two years. So we ended up um, contacting the manufacturer of the devices that we, that we loved and we discovered that um, uh, GLD Tech uh, and Professor Sonki Lim was very interested in working with us and um, creating new devices, um, updated devices that really met what the, the industry and the consumer and the research was indicating was needed. So in 2018, I traveled over to South Korea um, as part of the, um, the GMES Expo of medical devices. And uh, Sunki and I sat down and we nutted it out and uh, we created uh, a wonderful working relationship that we've been um, doing since. And so we have some great devices um, under our brand Cell LED that um, is, is really being utilised very heavily within uh, in-clinic settings, particularly uh, osteopaths, physios, integrative doctors, massage therapists use them and uh, consumers all around the world um, are using and loving our products. So as we, we started growing in this field and connecting with other organisations, we started taking on um, the distribution of many devices, um, including um, nose care devices, uh, which delivers PBM um, straight up into the, the brain through the nasal cavity. Uh, we have a relationship uh, with the Regen Pod people over there in the US, um, and uh, we, we just love their, their full body pods. We're really excited to see uh, where we can do some research in that space. Um, we use the, we distribute the Advent lasers, which are amazing devices. Um, and uh, we also are working with Violite as well. So that's, that's sort of about where we've, we've come to in our business. And I, I mentioned at the beginning, I wanted to talk about health psychology. You know, it's been really interesting, Joe, getting, getting involved in the PBM industry uh, talking to clinicians and researchers and when I introduce myself and I say I'm a health psychologist they have this you know confused look on their face you know why are you here you know why are you interested 
And I guess a lot of people don't know that health psychology is a discipline in itself. So I just wanted to briefly mention about why me as a health psychologist, I wish to be involved in this and where I think health psychology has a place in the PBM field. So health psychology is a specialty area. We're really interested in how biological and social and psychological functionings together influence our health and well-being. So we're, there's something known as the biopsychosocial model, um, and that's really at the corner uh, of, of our profession. So we're really interested in helping understand how people can be healthy or recover from illnesses, a particular chronic illnesses. And we also are really involved in um, hospital settings, the private practices, supporting people with their health and in health promotion. So helping develop programs that help promote good health, uh, lifestyle, behaviour changes, those sorts of things to help people improve their wellbeing. Um, and that mind-body connection is really at the centre, how to get the best um, results for people. So this is where I think health psychology can really lend itself to the efforts with photobiomodulation because I think helping consumers understand how photobiomodulation is relevant to their lives, how it could really help them and how they can use that, increase their uptake, their value and their, their outcomes utilising I think is really where health psychology can stand up and, and, and make a really valuable presence. So I think because of this interest, um, this is where I decided, you know, maybe with this unique position, I better start taking some steps forward, um, being bold and, and going out and talking to my colleagues, my, my fellow health psychologists about PBM and what it could possibly offer. Um, because if I didn't start with my own industry, my, my, own, my own people, then I didn't know how the world would react, let alone my colleagues. So... Last year, I put together a poster and I went along to the Australian National Health Psychology Conference and talked about my review in the use of PBM therapy for depression. And that was a really interesting experience. I had a range of responses from my colleagues. Some people were really interested and curious. Um, there were some people that would have like really pushed um, their, their comfort zones and, and probably found themselves kind of avoiding me a bit. Um, but I didn't have any resistance. There wasn't anyone um, challenging me or saying that this is, this is not uh, appropriate. Most people were really um, open and welcoming, especially because psychologists, we know that there are a lot of people with depression who are either not getting treatment or their treatment is not um, giving them lasting results or, or, or improving their lives. So we, we know that there is a need and it was really lovely to be able to talk about that and get some feedback from people on that. So I just want to briefly talk about depression in Australia as a whole. Um, I spend a lot of time educating um, the general public around uh, mental health and, and mental health care. And so I just wanted to mention a little bit about the state of Australia, and I guess this may be applicable around the world in terms of the, the problem that depression is. It wasn't long ago the World Health Organisation said that depression was the number one health concern that would impact the world, and I think it's really relevant that we talk about depression um, in the context of this summit, which is really exciting, so thanks, Jo. Um, so it's a really common depressive disorder. Um, it affects about 6% of the population in a year and in a given in their lifetime, one in six women and one in eight men are going to experience depression. So in this, in this country, in our small country, we have you know, around a million people each year who are going to be living with depression. And on some of the concerning statistics is 50% of sufferers don't seek treatment. They don't, they don't get help. Um, and there's a range of reasons why that's the case. Uh, a lot of the time, either they're not aware that what they're experiencing is depression um, or they, they have some barriers to seeking help and support. Um, and, you know, we know that there is a lot of flow-on effects because of mental illness. Um, you know, it has a lot of disease burden and we know that uh, there is a causal link between depression and suicide. 
Um, there are comorbidities, people who experience depression are much more likely to have other chronic health conditions. And on the flip side, those with chronic health conditions are more likely to have depression. So it's, it's a considerable burden on, on our population, on our economy, on our, on our families. So at the moment, the cost of the economy are estimated at about 50 billion per annum. Um, that's a lot of money that we could be saving with some really low cost devices um, that people could be utilizing in clinics and at home. So, you know, we know that this is a costly um, health burden on our society. So currently in Australia, we have um, mainly uh, antidepressant medications uh, that are used to treat uh, depression. Um, so we have our tricyclic antidepressants, we have our SSRIs, our SNRIs, and the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Um, and you know the, the results that people get from antidepressant medication are pretty mixed. You know, I talk about this a lot with my clients around their options and outcomes that can you know, be um, experienced. Um, and of course, there's all the side effects that come from medications as well, which some people are happy to, to live with if it gives them some improvement in their mood. Um, but a lot of times people come off of medication um, because of those side effects or even the fact that their medication has not been effective. Then we have psychotherapy. This is the area that I work in most of the time. Um, we have, uh, you know, psychologists like myself, mental health practitioners, a lot of the time we're using modalities like cognitive behaviour therapy and psychoeducation, which helps people understand more about what depression is and how they can help themselves improve their mood. So in Australia, we have uh, Medicare, which is our, our, our public um, health system. And through Medicare, um, Australians can access what's called a mental health care plan. Um, and that gives them access to some Medicare funding to help them support the cost um, of receiving um, mental health services from someone like myself. Um, but there's also community mental health centres, there's help, lots of helplines that people, the public utilise to try and help support their mental health. And of course, there's also non-profit profits, um, many based from, from church organisations and others that are there to try and help provide some support through some form of talk therapy. Now, the downside of those particular mainstream avenues is it's costly. You know, psychotherapy is time consuming. It's costly. Not everybody can afford it. And even though there are some provisions for what we call bulk billing or, you know, no, um, no gap services, it's really hard for consumers to get them. So, um, unfortunately, there is a lot of downsides to what we currently have. And we also have people that don't respond. Um, if someone has had two courses, different courses of um, uh, medications um, and some psychotherapy and they've not improved, um, you know, they're considered what's called treatment resistant. And there's not a lot of options for them. They might be able to access something like um, electroconvulsive therapy. Um, there's different types of neurotherapies and, and other things out there, but um, they're, they're not necessarily um, uh, got a very strong evidence base to help a lot of people. So, you know, what we really need is a low cost alternative um, that's non-evasive and can support people that are treatment resistant or have things like antenatal, um, postnatal depression, um, seasonal affective disorder. These are all different types of um, depressions that we really need more options. And I'm certainly aware that there are complementary alternative therapies. There's all sorts of other things out there that can help. Um, but we would love to see, you know, regular GPs mentioning to people, hey, there, there is another option here. And I think that's where um, this, this next part around what the research is around PBM for depression could, could offer. So there has been a long-term use of, of light to treat health conditions. Um, and in the space of depression, bright light therapy was something that was used quite a bit to try and help improve those who experienced um, depression, particularly in the darker, colder months of the year. So we know that, I, you know, there are many other amazing speakers in this summit that are going to talk about all the uses of, of um, phototherapy and photobiomodulation. I'm not going to um, sort of revisit a lot of what they've been talking about. 
But we certainly know that there are some reactions that happen in the body in those cells um, that can improve health and well-being. And it's kind of curious if we're looking at it from more of a mental health perspective, you know, what are the actual mechanisms of action that may be helping the mind and what we experience in mood? I think there's more work to be done to explain that. Um, but we do know there is some positive benefits in getting light to the brain um, and to other neurological conditions. So it's been wonderful to hear about the advances um, in those neurological conditions. Parkinson's disease, um, there's uh, other researchers have been mentioning about here in Adelaide, there's been clinical trials recently for the, the use of PBM and Parkinson's disease with some positive initial results. So it's been great to hear about those updates. And there's also these newer areas of the treatment for different mental health conditions, uh, depression, also anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder. So I'm really excited to see what some of the other um, presenters in the summit talk about in those areas too. So what's been interesting is when I started having a look at the research and the, what the literature was saying, there was many different ways that PVM was being applied to the body in order to have some effect on mood. And the main areas were the use of acupuncture points, um, sort of systemic transcranial photobiomodulation, um, intranasal applications, even through entering through the ear canals. And um, it was really interesting that no matter where the PBM was applied, every single study noticed some form of antidepressant effect, which is really interesting, including where PBM was applied to the area like the lower back and the upper legs. So it's, it's interesting what's going on. I'm not the expert to tell you that, but I'm just curious to know, hey, there's something going on and it's, it's benefiting people's mood. So when starting to have a look at the literature, we saw that there were several reviews um, for PBM and treatment of depression. The results are often shown by those researchers as, as a, dis, a decrease in score rather than, than baseline or final scores. Um, researchers like uh, a psychologist want to know what those raw scores were to be able to form um, more, more conclusive um, uh, conclusions. Um, so uh, I'm not sure why that's been presented in that way, but it has. And uh, those, the protocols and the studies really vary greatly. There's no particular consensus or, or consistency of which wavelength they're using, which irradiance, the fluence, or even the number of sessions that is being applied to. Some as little as one uh, intervention and some multiple with washout periods and so on. So, you know, that, that inconsistency um, is at the moment uh, a, a bit of a barrier, but this is why we need more research. So at the moment, these results are promising. Um, they decrease the depressive symptoms, but it is still early days because we're not seeing, at this stage, really large-scale clinical trials. I do know there are some happening, um, and I'm very keen to find out what they discover. So I thought I might highlight a few of the studies that we reviewed um, as part of our paper um, looking at some of these studies. So um, Schiffer and Associates, all the way back in 2009, they did a small clinical trial with 10 patients with a major depressive disorder uh, who also had com comorbid, comorbid disorders, including anxiety and post-traumatic distress and substance abuse. Um, and look, you know, in reality, in the real wide world, a lot of people with depression have some comorbidity, whether it's another mental health condition or a physical health condition. It's pretty normal. Um, what they did was a four-minute treatment um, at two different sites uh, on the head. So this is transcranial PBM that was being applied. They used 810 nanometers, um, 250 milliwatts per square centimeter, and ultimately 60 joules per, per square centimeter were delivered um, through laser. And um, the, the Hamilton depression scales, what they use is their measure of change. And they reported a decrease in score of 13 points um, at two weeks and six and a half points at the four weeks post-treatment. So there was some improvement over a period of time. Um, but again, 10 patients is a very small sample. But it was, I guess it was enough back then to say, hey, there's something to this and maybe more researchers um, could make some contributions. So as time went on, uh, Cassano, who's a big uh, researcher in this area, um, him and his associates put together another uh, small trial. Um, this particular one um, had only four patients, um, but it was a proof of concept study. So 
they had those with major depressive disorder and they gave them six sessions. Um, initially it was just it was just near infrared light that they were uh, delivering over three weeks. That was followed by a washout week and then three weeks of a sham treatment. And then they had um, another group that had firstly three weeks of sham treatment, then they went to a washout week and then three weeks of the near infrared treatment. So they, they reported this as a double blind randomized crossover design study um, and they reported some improvements in uh, the Hamilton depression uh, measure as well. Their choice was 808 nanometers um, and they had a bit of a higher dual dosage over a longer period of time. So there was again an improvement but uh, again not necessarily longitudinal results here. They just reported one time point um, for uh, their post-intervention measure. Another uh, review we've done on the Disner and Associates study, this was a larger study, which was great to see. It was a randomized sham control trial, um, a proof of concept study, this one, and they had 51 patients. Those all had some elevated symptoms of depression. It doesn't say in the study if they had been officially diagnosed with any particular disorder but that they had those elevated symptoms. So they gave them two sessions of a near infrared light uh, treatment two days apart. Um, it was a five, uh, five second active treatment, which is quite a short uh, period of time. And their choice was um, 10064 nanometers. Interesting to see them going up um, in, the, in the scale there. 250 milliwatts, 60 joules, not a massive dose, but um, still interesting to see the improvement. They use the Center of Ep Epidemiologic Studies depression scale um, and some improvements again here too, including at the two week follow up. So a larger, a larger sample, um, really interesting to see their application to the right and left forehead. Um, this is certainly something we're, we're sort of seeing in terms of the transcranial PVM is that the improvements tend to be when PVM is applied to one uh, lobe of the brain at the time um, rather than a, a, a full dosage across the entire head. So um, this is where it's really interesting to see where they chose to apply the PVM and yeah, again, an antidepressant effect. Uh, Cassano did another um, study with uh, his associates um, in 2018. Um, this was another um, really interesting study where they had another small sample um, with major depressive disorder. Um, they delivered 16 sessions, That's quite a substantially higher dosage over a period of time, 20, 30 minutes, um, and that was over eight weeks. Um, that was a really interesting comparison to some of the others where it was either single treatment or just a few treatments over a shorter period of time. Um, the difficulty here is even though they've, they've done some good work in terms of the way that they delivered and they also use the Hamilton depression scale, um, they haven't really provided some end results that we could take away and say, oh, this is the, the definite improvement. What they do report is a remission occurring in about 50% of the treatment group and remission in 18% of the control group. So um, again, no hard raw scores that we can take away, but their reports are an improvement in the treatment group. So hopefully that's a sign of where larger scale uh, trials um, may be able to fill those gaps and, and provide us with some, some data that we can look at more strongly. So overall, look, these, these studies, are all promising. <laughs> they show some improvements in symptoms of depression um, following the near infrared treatment. Um, and you know, it's great to see that these results are comparable with other antidepressant interventions. Um, and in some cases, some may argue that they are uh, even more um, uh, efficacious, but we can't draw those conclusions without larger scale trials um, and some more longitudinal results to see how those are sustained over time. What's really encouraging is there's very few, if any, side effects being noted by those participants so in terms of tolerability. Um, it's great to see that people are finding this a really easy treatment to receive, um, not, not major resistance from, from those who are participating. But really, there are more studies that are needed. It's, it's an area that does require more investment um, in, in larger scale clinical trials to see exactly what happens in terms of 
you know, the long the long term benefits. And uh, given at the moment it seems to be safe and easy to administer and tolerable, you know, there there should be efforts made in this area. So um, our paper, which is yet to be published, um, is uh, suggesting that future studies really need to focus on a design that is randomised, is sham controlled um, and, and double blind really to, to make sure that we've got a reasonable gold standard um, and that there needs to be some more consistency or conclusions drawn about which wavelength frequency. Is it 808? Is it 823? Is it 10064? Or does it not matter? Is it, is it really just a, a particular, uh, you know, um, uh, spectrum that is, is showing results? Should it be pulsed or is it is continuous light better? At the moment, um, that's, that's really not sure. I mean, there's a, a lot of clinicians that would say pulsed um, is the way of the future, but until we've got those studies and results, we can't say for sure how many sessions are needed um, and what's the radiance influence and ultimate, um, how many joules is the dosage. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done. Anecdotally, we found that with some of our um, customers and clinicians reporting just a single dose um, applied to the head using either laser or LED device produces fantastic results for people. And some people need frequent use over a period of time to get results. It's so individualised and I guess that's the different difficulty in this space is it may also be uh, up to individual differences as well. So I'll just pause there for a second, Joe, just in case you had anything you wanted to ask before um, I sort of move on to talking about, you know, where to from here. Well, I'm just saying that, you know, many of these studies we also have to review if they were LED, the majority of those studies were LED uh, related versus laser treatments, because that's another, you know, uh, another la level that in the decision tree that you pointed out. So the majority of this work has been with LEDs, which, you know, has to be stated versus what, you know, laser type of treatment or, or these sort of things, which, which are, there's an even less kind of work with the lasers is all I wanted to state. But, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I guess it's because devices like the Vilite, um, the, the, the alpha and the gamma, um, head wearing devices, they, they do allow for, you know, a comfortable delivery with a consistency rather than having someone, you know, standing there or, or having a device that's sort of all hooked up with the laser. Um, and it does also give people the option to use it from home. Um, so a lot of people, consumers, are just simply um, purchasing these devices and using them themselves from home, um, you know, not waiting for the research to come out, just being like, well, I'm going to give it a go. Um, so, so, yeah, it's, most, it's mostly LED. Wearables, you know, kind of are saying LED because not too many people can go around with the, with the laser and it's, you know, connected and plugged into the wall. And so it's not really... You know, it's more of an LED type of thing that we're talking about, so that's what I'm stating. Go ahead. Absolutely. Um, so with, with that, I guess Michael and I are both really interested and our team are really interested in, in furthering and being a part of more research and development. Um, we have a lot of opportunity because of our um, association with the Australian Medical Photobiomodulation Association, or AMPA, Formerly, formerly AMLA, the Australian Medical Laser Association. Um, they're, they're a very active and a fabulous group of people, researchers, clinicians, some of whom I'm sure you will have already been interviewed, uh, interviewing as part of this summit. Um, and we really enjoy being a part of their community. So we, we go along and we attend these events. They're usually held in Sydney. Um, and we love to update our, our knowledge and be able to collaborate with these uh, amazing, inspiring um, clinicians and researchers who are, who are really um, happy to collaborate with us. They sort of understand that we're not just um, some company trying to pump out as many panels as possible or um, not interested in the research. Um, and lots of marketing spin. We're actually, we want to be as informed as possible and passing on the right information, the most up-to-date research um, and practices to, to our um, customers because it really matters. We want to see people get results. Um, so we've been doing more research and development in wearable devices that are portable 
um, battery operated that we um, that gives variable pulse and frequencies and, and several different um, wavelengths so that people can have them uh, available not just sitting at their desk or in bed or you know one some of our devices have car chargers so they treat themselves in the car but having even more uses and applications so there's more happening in that space which is really exciting and we're also really excited that we are in the early stages of collaborating on research using um, various devices most especially the the biophotonica regen pods um, which we would be really excited to see when people are, you know, immersed in the light and different areas of the body being treated, how does that affect chronic health conditions? How does that affect depression? So, you know, it is early stages, but our intentions are to be involved in the research efforts and to see what kinds of outcomes people can get um, using particularly LED-based devices. And we, we love educating people. As a, as a health psychologist, I have been... Um, educating, speaking, presenting, lecturing on various topics for a long time. My mother's a teacher. I guess teaching is just in my blood. I really enjoy um, speaking and teaching and educating people. So we, we decided that we wanted to make that a part of our business model, um, helping people understand what they use. So I've got some images here from past events that we've run. Um, we had fun running an online Facebook Messenger-based training, a, a general public um, intended training on red light therapy, helping them understand, you know, what it was, how they could use it, what types of devices out there and, and covered everything from lasers to panels to wearables to pods. Um, and we had like dozens and dozens of people from all around the world engage, ask questions. Um, and that was really rewarding. So we're hoping to run more of those sorts of events. Um, and the, the, the image over here on the, the far right of the screen is Michael uh, presenting to one of our local integrative medicine centres to some integrative doctors who have since um, started using personally our devices and uh, utilising them with their patients. So, you know, whether they're clinicians and helping clinicians understand how they can use um, PBM and their practices and consumers, you know, we, we sort of cover all of that and hope to see more events um, and resources, whether they're online or face-to-face, -face, be available for people. So I guess this is where I sort of wanted to just talk about briefly, you know, what, what's happening in terms of uh, the types of practitioners and professionals involved in PBM currently and into the future. You know, I, I really, uh, I'm probably one of many PBM um, enthusiasts who go, well, why isn't everybody using this stuff? You know, why is this taking so long for us to, for it to be an everyday thing that we all, you know, talk about, you know, that the people can um, support each other with. And look, we do know that there are a small number of medical and allied health professionals that already use some form of PBM therapy, um, whether it's through lasers or phototherapy or, or LED. But we do have um, nurses. Uh, we know that medical and integrative doctors use this and that physios, osteopath, osteopaths and chiros um, already have some awareness of it. We know that chiropractors are often taught about uh, laser therapy from training onwards, um, but it's, there's still a long way to go. And really, we really hope that more therapists become aware of PBM as a complementary therapy. Like it's not, it's not meant to be a threat to the other forms of uh, mainstream medicines that are available, but rather a complement to them. Most of them work quite comfortably hand in hand with medications, um, can be used after surgeries or, or with, uh, with other forms of therapy. They can be used for preventative care. Um, you know, even in some situations, they are, PBM is a standard of practice, particularly um, thinking of oromucositis. Um, and in America, it's the standard of care. Oral mucositis, you know, is a terrible condition uh, affecting people going through chemo and, and uh, radiotherapy. Um, and there is, really isn't other, any other option that gives proper relief but PBM does, um, and we just hope that there are more efforts put into making that mainstream for everybody. Or at the very least, that these, these professionals can at least know what PBM is and have it incorporated um, into their knowledge base so that when their patients ask about it or they, they realise that patients may benefit from it, that it can at least be talked about, that there's at least some discussion on it. Um, and this is where us as 
as health professionals, even myself as a psychologist, you know, it's actually in my business to know what's available to people mm -hmm. and to have some understanding of it so I can have an informed conversation, not just dismissing people's interests or things they'd like to explore. The consumer has a right to choice and they have a right to look after themselves in the way they feel is right and we're here to help them make an informed decision. Informed consent, you know. What yeah, are your informed options? consent. What are your Absolutely. options? I know what are their options? Yeah, and also being aware of where there could be contraindications, who they may need to talk to if they're thinking about incorporating it. Um, so, you know, we, we really do have a duty of care to know and to discuss it. Complementary and alternative medicine practitioners, um, I think have got a real opportunity in this space. Um, and we know that there are some massage therapists, naturopaths, kinesiologists that already use PBM. Um, we have some of our, our customers who are massage therapists that utilize them within their treatments. So often they'll use um, one of our belts across a, a larger area of the body before they then treat it and they find that the, the body is so much more responsive, it's more supple, there's less tension and people res report much better outcomes. Uh, and sometimes that'll lend out or, or on-sell a device that people can use from home to maintain gains. Um, I guess at the, end, at the end of the day, I know that there is challenges for us licensed professionals to think about bringing in new therapies into our practice or recommending them to our, our patients and clients. It's such a difficult, it's a difficult thing when we do have, um, you know, our license re restricting some of the things that we can do and say um, to make sure that we're staying with our scope of practice. So I, I understand that there is natural hesitation from a lot of professionals until there is sufficient overwhelming evidence and then their professional body says, yeah, it's fine, you can talk about it or you can administer it. Um, but I think regardless of whether or not um, those professional bodies are ready to do that yet, and I'm not going to go into uh, other interested parties who may or may not want PVM out there in the, in the big wide world, um, but at least understanding about it and supporting people making their own health choices I think is important. So I would say, you know, if there is a way you could um, do some professional development, um, get some skills in either using lasers if that's what's right for your type of hands-on um, practice or um, having an awareness or use of LED-based devices because they're, you know, very easy and consumer-friendly. You know, I would say it's worthwhile because this is medicine of the future and, you know, while I've talked about depression today and, and mental health, you know, it's so much broader and the more broadly we're using this, this amazing type of medicine, this light therapy, the more people's health, well-being, our economies, our families are going to benefit. I'm with you. Because we know when, when people are introduced to this stuff, we know from the hundreds of our friends and family in our networks, people we've met, when they're introduced to it properly, appropriately, with an informed basis, people are quite open. And when they realise how simple it is, how easy it is for them to treat themselves um, all over the body, they they love it and they report they find it comforting. You know, wearing wearing our devices, you know, it gets a little warm, it's really comforting and nurturing, people love that. Um, and so, you know, most people are reporting amazing outcomes, fantastic outcomes. We love hearing, um, you know, the feedback and testimonials from our, our consumers. Um, and with the right instructions, um, people can use flexible, devices safely and administer them from home. Um, and so we'd love to see more of that happening. So I just wanted to acknowledge um, Michael Liner, my partner. He really helped me organize this presentation and he's a wealth of knowledge. My, my other half is like a, a freaky genius. He just remembers uh, so much about so much. And so he's a wonderful resource. A lot of our customers and clients and uh, professional partners, they, they love talking with him and collaborating. And uh, also really like to thank Dr. Donna Roberts, who is my co-author on this paper and has been so helpful um, supporting me to pull it all together. So um, so that's essentially it, Joe. Wonderful, wonderful. I, I enjoyed it. I like the, I like the way everything was laid out and that you gave us a walkthrough of, uh, of not only uh, the depression and how it can be, you know, maybe interpreted, but
but also that these are being used by people in your network, people that you talk to, and that you're getting this feedback that, you know, use it. Use it, get something at home that you can use. Uh, there's, you know, no side effects. It's easy. You can do it whenever you want in the comfort of your own home and put it on, you know, put it where it hurts and, you know, just make a, a light a part of your diet make it a part of your lifestyle and so i you know i fully support that and uh, i'm i'm down with all with what you're saying i appreciate your time and giving us the the the, fu the future as you already explained to us is you know one in every household maybe two absolutely uh, it would be such a thrill to see that happen and you know i think it's well overdue it's time amen to that well for, let's keep it going and uh, thanks for participating in the summit. It's been my pleasure. Thanks so much, Joe, for your efforts in putting all this together. It's been uh, exciting to be a part of your first summit. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.